Hey gang, uh, anticipated short video here. Sometimes I anticipate short videos and I start running my mouth and I get all tore up and <laughs> they turn into longer videos than what I anticipate, but uh, I don't think that's going to happen here. Uh, let's. Uh, what I want to do is uh, I want to show you how to work a couple of problems using R and then I'm going to follow it up with a discussion on uh, errors that we encounter in hypothesis testing. So that at the top should say hypothesis testing with R and errors. Now let's assume that you're uh, on a deserted island somewhere and they tell you if you can work these two, <clears throat> uh, these two statistics problems then we're going to get you off of this deserted island. But you can't use your calculator, you got to use R. Now, right, this is really going to happen. Uh, but let's pretend it does. So you got to work uh, these problems with R. So what would you do? Well, you would, you would let me teach you. And that's what I'm getting ready to do right now. So uh, the problem, first problem, says the following miles per gallon are collected on eight cars. Uh, the population standard deviation is unknown. Uh, test um, that the average miles per gallon for all cars is higher than 24. Well, you know, this, this obviously, uh, at least... I think, obviously, now you should know that we're going to run a t-test. And I think you should also know that before you start punching a bunch of buttons and start doing crazy stuff, always set up the null and alternative hypothesis before you conduct uh, the test. Now, it doesn't matter whether you're using R or the graphing calculator, always set up your null and alternative hypothesis first so you can um, uh, interpret the uh, results of the, uh, of the test. So as I've taught you before, the best thing to do is go to the alternative first and see what you're testing. We're testing higher than 24. All right, come up. Now, guys, I prefer this notation, just mu equal to 24, and it's much more standard notation than what you see with Hawks. But if you do that in Hawks, they're going to count it wrong. So you're going to have to play the game and put this in Hawks. This is my preference. This is Hawks preference. This is mathematically sound, probably more so than what I do, uh, the, 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 the notation or the, the, the way I enter the uh, null hypothesis. But this is much more standard notation when you, uh, when you get out there and research. Uh, it doesn't say what the alpha level is. So if the alpha level is not given, we're going to set it at the industry standard. Okay. Now, if I were going to run this on the calculator, um, just to show you nothing, nothing crazy is going on, you know, I would just type the numbers in real quickly. And um, I've already got some numbers there. So uh, I'm going to type in 23, 28, uh, 31, 25, uh, 29, 32, and 20 and 14. All right, I'm going to go to stat. I'm going to go over to test. I'm going to run a t-test. Uh, my null hypothesis is 24. Uh, hold on. We've got, uh, we got data here, so we need to choose, uh, choose data. Uh, so mu, ze mu zero, the, the value in the uh, null hypothesis is 24. I put my numbers in L1, and I am testing what did I say? I'm testing greater than. And I do calculate. Now I've got tunnel vision here on the test statistic, and I'm going to write this down. <clears throat> so the test statistic is uh, 0.58, and the p value is 0.29. Now, gang, you should know by now that the p value is greater than 0.05 tells us that we fail to reject. H sub O, which says the results are inconclusive, that the mean is greater than 24. So based on this, we can't conclude anything other than the mean is less than or equal to 24, the mean is equal to 24. So the results are inconclusive, uh, and we do not have st statistical significance. Uh, statistical significance is... Uh, 
well, you get statistical significance when your p-value is less than alpha. So uh, that, that's, a, that's a critical something that uh, I don't think we've talked about exactly, but, um, uh, or maybe we have, I'm not sure. But, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's, let's write that down so we know. So if, our, uh, if we reject H sub O, which is going to happen when? When our p-value uh, is less than alpha, then our results are said to be statistically significant. If we fail to reject H sub O, which will happen, of course, when our p-value is greater than or equal to alpha, then our results are not statistically significant. All right, so I take a screenshot, get that in your notes, and that's going to be uh, something you'll want to know. Now, I would probably, um, you know, want to run the 95% confidence interval, and, you know, that's, that's going to be super easy to do. We did a t-test, so we know we're going to use a t-interval. And uh, did 0 0.05, so we'll run the 95% confidence level, so our... Uh, answer here would be uh, 20.16 to 30.34. Now, how would you do this in R? Well, uh, we, we've got our answers there. So let's, um, let's, let's bring up R. I got it here somewhere. All right, so what a first, of all, first thing I'd want to do is I'd want to put my data in. So I'm going to just put miles per gallon. And I have to use what's called the C function. You can't just type numbers into R. You have to type them in a uh, kind of a, uh, you know, really, I don't even know what C stands for. Uh, it, it, it just turns out to be a vector, but, uh, well, so anyway, uh, it's, this is just uh, the way you got to do it. Uh, so separate the numbers uh, with uh, commas. Type them carefully. All right. Let's go back through and just make sure we got them right. Uh, 23, 28, 31, 25, 29, 32, 40. Cool. Now, to run a t-test, it's really, really easy. You just type t-test. And uh, uh, in the first... Uh, uh, spot you put the vector the numbers if you will to keep it simple that you want to run the t-test on the next thing you do is your mu value and ours I think was in uh, our problem was 24 and then the next thing you do is you set up your alternative and we wanted what uh, greater than so we put greater than all right so we hit enter and we get the results of our t-test. And you can see that the, the test statistic is 0.58. Uh, our p-value is uh, 0.29, just as we uh, got. Uh, so our alternative, it states it here, greater than 24. And our 95% confidence interval uh, gets kind of wacky here, okay? Uh, to get the true 95% confidence interval, it's kind of weird the way you got to do this. You have to go, if you, by the way, if you just hit your up arrow on your, on your arrows, left to right, up and down, just hit your up arrow, it will come uh, bring uh, uh, what you typed in the previous line uh, there, uh, where you can edit it. So what we would need to do there is uh, we would, um, uh, to get the 95% confidence interval, we actually have to rerun this without the alternative. And when we do that, you'll see that we get the 20.16, 30 um, 30.34. I'm not really sure why R works this way. Now, notice that your p-value is going to be wrong when you do this. Your p-value uh, for this problem is 0.289. Uh, 
uh, or well, 0 0.29, uh, your p-value will be wrong, but you've got to rerun this without the alternative if you're doing a greater than or less than test. Now, if you're doing not equal to, wham, bam, thank you, man, you get everything you want uh, in one. But uh, if, if you run alternative greater than or less than, then you have to rerun the t-test without the alternative command uh, to get the correct 95% confidence interval. All right? So, uh, really... I don't know, uh, kind of quick. I, I, I mean, I, the way R does it, I kind of uh, pr prefer that in a sense. Now, let's go back to the handout, uh, and uh, let's, let's work the second problem. So, uh, you know, same, same kind of deal here. Uh, but uh, in this one, we can, uh, you know, clearly see when we... Um, uh, read the problem that this problem clearly uh, deals with the percentage. So guys, um, I mean, you should know this by now, that anything that deals with the percentage uh, in this class, uh, we deal, uh, use a one prop Z test. So just like before, uh, you know, you're going to want to set up the null and alternative hypothesis. So let's see what's going on here. It says in a recent survey, 2191 randomly selected adults 461 said they would prefer to have a girl if they could have only one child. Uh, use the sample data to test the claim that less than 25% of adults would prefer to have a girl if they could only have one child. So we're testing P less than 0.25. So here we're going to have P greater than or equal to 0.25 to keep Hawks happy. Uh, I would write it that way. I think that's uh, preferable. That's my preference, but uh, I want you to get problems right when you work them on Hawks, so, so play the game uh, with them. And, and again, guys, there's nothing wrong with this. It. technically correct. This is just a, a notation I think that's more commonly reported. So, uh, uh, you know, next thing we're going to do, if we're going to do this on the calculator, uh, we're just going to keep it simple. We're going to go stat. We're going to go over to test. And we're going to go one prop Z test. So what do we, uh, we're testing, what, 0.25? Well, it's already there. Uh, X is the count out of the hole. So there were 461 out of, what, 2191. And we want to test less than. Yeah. All right. So uh, it's that simple, that quick. Uh, now this is, I'm, I'm glad this happened. This is something kind of uh, kind of good. Okay, now our our test statistic is going to be a z value here, and this is negative four point two eight. And your p value, it is so easy to get sloppy here, and report your p value at nine point three five. Guys, a p value is a probability. If we say that the null hypothesis is true, the p-value tells us the probability that we get our sample or a sample more extreme. In this case, uh, what are we testing? Lower than? Yeah, uh, less than. So uh, probability has to be between 0 and 1. So the red flag should go up here. This can't be the answer. And if you look out here at the end, you can see that this is in scientific notation telling us that we have to move the decimal place six places to the left. So that moves one place there, and then I have to keep moving it five more to put in five zeros. So ultimately, the p-value here is 0 0.00093. So guys, don't get, uh, don't get caught up in that. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's just easy to get sloppy here and see the 9.34 p-value is a probability. Okay, uh, so there is conclusive evidence here because our p-value is clearly less than our alpha. Uh, again, if alpha isn't stated, uh, set it to 0.05. Uh, this number, the p-value, is clearly less than alpha, so we would reject H sub O. So uh, the, we have statistical evidence. We have our, our result is statistically significant. Uh, the results are conclusive that the percentage of uh, 
adults who would have a child if they could only have one child is less than 20 uh, 25 percent, 0.25. Now, how would you do this on, uh, again, you're on this deserted island. They're saying if you can work this problem using R, uh, you're going to get off uh, the island. Uh, with all the rain lately, I don't even know if I'd want to get off the island. Uh, all right, uh, how would we do that? Well, guys, there's a uh, command uh, called a prop test. And the first thing you put is the count. Next thing you put is all the people that were surveyed or the total sample size. The next thing you put is the value that you want to test. So P, we want to test 0.25. So you put the uh, null hypothesis. And then the... Uh, Final thing you'll, well, actually two more things. We want the alternative to be equal to what? Less. And we have to do something called a correct. Now, I'm not even going to get into this just other than to tell you you need to do this. There's something called a Yates continuity correction that we can sometimes implement. We don't want to implement that. So guys, when we get this, um, we get um, the same situation. Uh, we get a p-value. Now this gives you uh, x squared, and this is kind of kind of weird. To get your z, uh, we have to take the square root of the x squared. So uh, now wait a minute, is that right? Uh, yeah, it is. So we've got to take the square root of the 18.3187 to get the z. Yeah. So 4.28 uh, is the z. Now, you know, obviously, it's negative because our 461 out of 2191 uh, is uh, less than 0.25 be kind of goofy statistics and in, in other words, let me sh let me show you what I'm going on here so I have 461 uh, divided by 2191 so our sample proportion is 0.21 which is less than the 0.25 that we're uh, that we're uh, testing so uh, we have to just use in folk a little bit of what I would call statistics common sense here that since our sample proportion is less than what we're testing our our uh, test statistic would have to be negative. Now, notice again, it gave you something wacky uh, with this 95% confidence interval, but again, the solution's simple. Let's just hit the up arrow until we get to where we ran our, uh, 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 our test. And all I want to do is just get rid of the alternative statement. Now, this is going to run a two-tail test, which we don't want the p-value and all that from, but this is going to give us the uh, ninety five percent confidence interval that we need, okay all right um, now uh, another type of problem that we get into uh, are these these types of problems uh, find the p value when conducting a right tail test where t is one point two nine n is equal to 45. Now, right tail test tells me that the sign in the alternative hypothesis is greater than. The test statistic being a t tells me that I've conducted a t-test. So I need to work this problem with the t-distribution. <clears throat> degrees of freedom are going to be 44, 1 minus the sample size. I also know that in these types of problems, when I have a right tail test, my p-value calculation is done in the right tail. So I need to find the area in the distribution with degrees of freedom 44. I need to find the area to the right. Now, this would be really easy with our calculator. Uh, you know, as I've shown before, go second function distribution uh, and come down to TCDF. 
Come in 1.29 up to E99 because we're going all the way to infinity. And then put in the degrees of freedom 44. And we see that the area to the right, hence the p value, is 0 0.1019. <clears throat> now you're stuck on this deserted island. You only got R. You need to work this problem to find a way off the island. How are you going to do it? Well, guys, it's easy. Uh, you're going to use PT. But as I've shown before, PT finds the probability below. So I need to come in and go 1 minus this answer because I want the area above. So it's going to give me the area below 1.29 with the degrees of freedom 44. Now the answer is going to be 0 0.1019 uh, for, this, uh, for this problem. And you can see that R gives us the same thing. PT always finds area below. So this command of PT 1.29,44 is going to give me the area to the left. But I know that the area under the curve total, area to the left plus area to the right, of, of any uh, point in the distribution is going to be 1 for the t distribution. So I just, again, use a little bit of statistics common sense and uh, subtract from 1. Now the next problem here we get, we have a two-tailed test. Well, a two-tailed test tells me that the sign in the alternative hypothesis is not equal to. So this tells me that I have to come in here with the t-distribution degrees of freedom 18. Sample size 19, degrees of freedom 18, okay? I gotta find the area to the right I'm sorry, to the left of point nine, negative point 0.91 and to the right of the positive. So this, this problem right here, if this was t equal positive point 0.91, it would work out the same way. If this was t equal 2, I would look at the area above 2 and the area below negative 2. So you look at the plus and the minus of the, uh, the test statistics that's given and you look at this area. Well, guys, this is really simple to do. Uh, in with your with your calculator, and I know I just got to I double this, so I'm just going to go ahead and put that in. And uh, for no real reason, I, just because I like positive numbers, maybe, uh, who knows? I'm just going to use the area to the right. And my p value would be 0.3748. All right, now how would we do that in R? <clears throat> well, since R by default finds area below, then I'm just going to use the negative 0.91, and that way I don't have to get into any subtracting from 1 or anything like that. So I'm going to, I know i got to multiply this answer by 2, and I'm going to go PT negative 0.91 with degrees of freedom 18. And you're going to see that we get exactly uh, the same answer, okay? Uh, and I, yeah, I think it works uh, kind of slick, really. I, I mean, I, it, it's quick. It's, uh, you don't have to do multiple things, uh, yada, yada, yada. All right, gang, let's talk about errors. Um, I wanted this to be a short video, but actually it's going to turn out to be a little longer than what I anticipated. I think you'll see these problems again. Hmm. <laughs> Who knows? Well, I know I've been talking a long time because my coffee's cold, and that's not cool. All right, gang, let's talk about errors in hypothesis testing. And ultimately, uh, this discussion... kind of comes full circle to, to talk about what's up with alpha. Okay, well, you know, what is up with alpha? Well, 
Alpha is usually set at 0.05. It has something to do with our decision to reject or fail to reject, right? Well, it actually turns out it's much, much, much more than that. Um, I'll tell you what, I'm going to start a new sheet of paper because I'm going to need a lot of stuff here. Now, this H sub O that we ultimately make a decision about, this H sub O is either true or false. Is the percentage of people who wants to have uh, only a girl uh, 25%? It either is or it isn't. We're ultimately going to come in and make a decision. And the only two decisions that we can make is either to reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject. Now, if we look at this two by two table here, let's see what happens. If H sub O is true and we reject it, then we have committed an error. If H sub O is false and we reject it, then we have done good. So I'm going to give a smiley face here because when that happens, the test has worked as it should have. Now, if this, value, if this statement in H sub O is true, then we hope we don't reject it. Guys, we don't go around rejecting true statements. We want to fail to reject true statements. So when this happens, it's got a smirky smile, uh, that's good too. The problems happen in the other two squares, if you will. And I'm going to put a big one here, and I'm going to put a big two here. It turns out that when we reject a true null, we have committed a type 1 error. So gang, a type 1 error is what? If I ask you on your, on your final exam, what's a type 1? Go to your drawing and say what? It is rejecting a true null hypothesis. Okay, what's a type 2 error? Go to your table. A type 2 error is failing to reject a false null hypothesis. Okay, now in this box right up here, I want you to put an alpha, and in this box right here, I want you to put a beta. Alpha is the probability of a type 1 error. So the alpha is the probability of committing a type 1 error. Beta is the probability of committing a type 2 error. So, when alpha is 0 0.01, we will commit... a type 1 error 1% of the time. So we have a 1% chance, 0.01 probability, of committing a type 1 error. When alpha is the standard of 0 0.05, we have a 5% chance of committing a type 1 error. Now this kind of makes you raise your eyebrows a little bit and makes you think, no, wait a minute, errors are bad, right? If we set at the industry standard, we have a five times higher chance of committing an error, a type 1 error. So why in the world do we set alpha 0 0.05 when back here we would commit one-fifth 
of the errors that we set uh, that we would commit when we set it at 0 0.05. Well, there's a dilemma. There's a uh, dilemma here. And the dilemma as alpha increases beta decreases. As alpha in, uh, decreases beta increases. So as alpha goes up, we increase the probability of committing a type 1, we decrease the probability of committing a type 2. As alpha decreases, the probability of a type 2 increases. Now I think a really good table to think about this is the following. Many videos ago, I said that alpha is usually set, doesn't have to be, <clears throat> at one of these four values. Without question, by far, alpha, the industry standard, is 0.05. And it may make a little bit of sense why after I give you this illustration. Now again, alpha is the probability of a type 1. So if we set alpha at 0 0.001, rarely, only one out of every 1,000 tests, and we only commit it one time, or we only conduct it one time. So rarely would you commit a type 1 error. But because, well, it's going down. If, as we move down and increase alpha, we would often, 10% of the time, and still you got a 90% chance of getting it right, but 10% uh, of, uh, of the time, uh, you're going to commit a type 1 error. Now, because these things work inversely, if you rarely commit a type 1, it's going to open the door for committing more type 2s. Same thing down here. If you open the door for committing a type 1, you're rarely going to commit a type 2. So what do people do? A lot of people will sit down and they'll think about the consequences of type 1 and type 2 errors. A lot of, and if the type 1 is worse, then they'll set their alpha low. If the type 2 is worse, they'll set their alpha high. Most people, most researchers don't want to think about all that stuff. And they want to uh, just find some middle ground and they set alpha at 0 0.05. Kind of balances out the effects of the type 1 and type 2 error, errors that are potential. Now how do you know when you commit an error? Well, you don't. You make the decision, you understand that, uh, that errors do exist. And, uh, you, you know, you just... Uh, at least at your all stage, you just add that to your to your dialogue, to your uh, to your vocabulary for statistics, and uh, you know be able to take it uh, or talk uh, talk about it, discuss it. At least at least uh, at, at least long enough to take your final. And what you do after that, that's that's totally up to you. Uh, so uh, guys, what uh, in the previous problem? that we started out with, I think it was uh, greater than 24. Actually, as I think about it, the problem for the miles per gallon problem, uh, way back when, that wasn't. It was uh, greater than 24. My bad. <clears throat> so gang, what's a type 1? Well, textbook definition Rejecting a true null. In the context of this problem, the miles per gallon is 24. So this is actually true. And we reject it. Concluding that the mean is 20, the miles per the the average miles per gallon is is greater than 24 when it's not. 
So we're an engineer for this car company. We go out and, you know, new evidence has emerged that the mean miles per gallon for this particular car is actually higher than the reported 24. Well, our results lied to us. Doesn't happen often. Guys, it's, the, the, the door is always open for that uh, to, uh, to, to, to happen. So we're going out there saying that our mean is uh, 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 higher than 24 when it's not. A type 2 error is what? Failing to reject. A false. Null. Now, what's that mean in this situation? Well, false null. And this is where actually, uh, I got to give Hawks credit. This is where actually the less than or equal does actually uh, help uh, with the interpretation. So a false null says that the mean is not less than or equal to 24. It's not 24, but we fail to reject it. The mean is actually higher than 24, but we find it's less than or equal to 24. So the mean miles per gallon is greater than 24, but we find otherwise. So that would be a situation where maybe the uh, engineers of this car are just dying to work with the marketing department and say, hey, guys, th the mean is actually higher than what you guys are giving us credit. And we, w the, the engineers could conduct the test, and by no fault of their own, they just got a crappy sample. Uh, they found that the mean uh, uh, is uh, actually, uh, hold on now, failing to reject, so this is false. So uh, uh, the mean is, really is greater than 24, uh, but we find otherwise. We find it's actually uh, less than or equal to 24. So we can't go ahead with the marketing campaign uh, because uh, even though the mean truly is greater than 24, our statistical evidence uh, found otherwise. Uh, gang, have a good one.